Ah, the Thanksgiving holiday, with the turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy, sweet potatoes, cranberry sauce and corn, and leave some room for pumpkin pie and cherry pie and pecan pie. From grandma and grandpa to the youngest of kids, and good friends who come to share the feast in the spirit of friendship and good cheer. Who doesn't love Thanksgiving? Many of us learned in elementary school about the very first Thanksgiving in 1621. The pilgrims who landed a year earlier at Plymouth Rock in what is now Massachusetts came to America to exercise their religious freedom. They threw a big feast to celebrate their first year in the new year, and they invited over their new neighbors, the friendly Indians, including the handsome Squanto, who taught them how to grow corn. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Also, about the time we were in elementary school, we learned about other special holidays, like when the Easter Bunny brings all children baskets of brightly colored eggs, or when Santa Claus flies all the way from the North Pole in a sled pulled by reindeer to bring presents to every child in the world, all on one night. As we grow into adulthood, we learn that many of the stories we heard as children are more complex than we originally were told. But what about Thanksgiving? The one day of the year when you can totally ignore your diet or how fat you might be. It's the one day where without guilt you can totally chow down until your stomach bloats and your seams burst. And yet it is a day that many American Indians have called a national day of mourning. As adults, we learn that those European invaders stole the land, murdered the friendly Indians who showed them how to plant the sacred corn, and spread diseases that killed many more Indians than the bullets. We learned that they already had their religious freedom in Holland before coming to Plymouth Colony, which primarily was a commercial venture to harvest the riches of the New World by European merchants. Reportedly, the pilgrims did not even land on the rock that today is known as Plymouth Rock, which first appeared in written accounts 120 years after the original landing. So, what is the truth about Thanksgiving? The truth about the original Thanksgiving is that only one written document exists from that period that mentions, in a single paragraph, the feast that we learned about as kids. And we learned it was not even called Thanksgiving until much later. The Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts, reports that of the original 102 passengers who set sail in 1620 aboard the 100-foot-long cargo ship Mayflower, only 53 were still alive the following year to attend the 1621 feast. In 1622, a year following the feast, one of the surviving colonists, Edward Winslow, wrote the following in a document now known as Mort's Relation, or more correctly titled, A Relation or Journal of the Beginning and Proceedings of the English Plantation Settled in Plymouth in New England by Certain English Adventurers, Both Merchants and Others. Here's what he wrote. Pretend I have a British accent. You shall understand that in this little time that a few of us have been here, we've built seven dwelling houses and four for the use of the plantation and have made preparation for diverse others. We set the last spring some twenty acres of Indian corn and sowed some six acres of barley and peas. And according to the manner of the Indians, we manured our ground with herrings, or rather shads, which we have in great abundance and take with great ease at our doors. Our corn did prove well, and God be praised we had a good increase in Indian corn, and our barley indifferent good. But our peas not worth the gather, for we feared they were too late sown. They came up very well and blossomed, but the sun parched them in the blossom. Our harvest being gotten, our governor sent four men on fowling, that so we might after a special manner rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help beside, served the company almost a week at which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and amongst the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, 
which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. We have found the Indians very faithful in their covenant of peace with us, very loving and ready to pleasure us. We often go to them, and they yielded willingly to be under the protection and subjects to our sovereign Lord King James, so that there is now great peace amongst the Indians themselves, which was not formerly, neither would have been but for us. And we, for our parts, walk as peaceably and safely in the wood as in the highways in England. We entertain them familiarly in our houses, and they, as friendly, bestowing their venison on us. They are a people without any religion or knowledge of any god, yet very trusty, quick of apprehension, ripe-witted, just, the men and women go naked, only a skin about their middles. So what is the truth about Thanksgiving? The truth is that all we really know about what happened at that feast in the autumn of 1621 at Plymouth Plantation is contained in that short passage from the journal. One other written account by the pilgrim William Bradford describes details of the harvest that autumn, but does not mention the feast. Everything else we have seen or heard describing the original Thanksgiving, whether from the school textbooks written by the dominant culture, from paintings, from movies and TV shows, or from the words of Native American activists and historians, are all just speculations, opinions, and conjectures. Even the most widely seen Native American account of the first Plymouth Harvest Feast from the Public Broadcasting Service series American Experience, titled We Shall Remain After the Mayflower, was full of dialogue, costumes, makeup, locations, and images that were created by writers and filmmakers based on speculations and guesses about what it had been like. So to try to get at the truth, let's look more closely at Mort's relation and that original letter by William Winslow that described the Pilgrim's Feast. That journal chronicles the pilgrim's first year from leaving Europe on the Mayflower to arriving in Cape Cod Harbor and then exploring for a suitable place to build their colony. It describes their first encounters with the local Wampanoag Indians, the building of houses and common structures, and establishing firm trading relationships with the various Wampanoag villages throughout the following year. It also contains a letter sent back home to England describing their positive experiences and a final chapter trying to justify their taking of Indian lands through biblical scripture and British common sense. Using that document as a basis, along with other published reports, here is a speculative view of the truth about Thanksgiving. A couple of years before the pilgrims arrived in Cape Cod Harbor, the Wampanoag tribe lost over half their people from diseases brought in by earlier European invaders. So when the pilgrims arrived and started making excursions into the land around what is now called Plymouth, they encountered many vacant native lodges and unattended cornfields. The Wampanoag in neighboring villages were very wary of catching more diseases. Pawtuxet, the Indian village that was where the pilgrims established Plymouth, had been completely wiped out except for one man, Tisquantum, also known as Squanto, who had escaped the disease when seven years earlier he had been captured by a British sea captain and sold into slavery in Spain. By the intercession of friars, Squanto was released and made his way to England, where he learned English as the servant to a merchant. He returned to his homeland, and because of his English skills, he became an interpreter, one of the voices of the British, to the other Indians. Walt Disney Pictures made a film in 1994 called Squanto, A Warrior's Tale, starring Adam Beach, Eric Schweig, and Irene Bedard, and a tale it is, because it contains many fabrications and historical inaccuracies, including its depiction of the Pilgrim Feast. From Plymouth records, only 53 pilgrims attended the feast. Winslow stated that about 90 Indians, led by Osamican, known as Massasoit, attended the feast. This means that about twice as many Indians as pilgrims were at that feast, which is something that is usually not shown in movies or paintings of the first Thanksgiving. 
Today we celebrate Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday in November, a date set during the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration in 1941. But the Plymouth Feast was probably held in late September or October of 1621. Massasoit's home village was what today is called Warren, Rhode Island, which is south of Providence and about 40 miles west of the Plymouth colony. The pilgrim Edward Winslow did not say they invited Massasoit over for dinner. He just happened by, 40 miles away from home with 90 people. Winslow also said their governor sent four men out to get birds and they brought back four fowl, plus it also said for recreation they were exercising their arms, which means they were shooting off their firearms a lot. All this lends credence to the Wampanoag oral history that Massasoit was called to come and see what all the shooting was about and brought a display of force so the pilgrims could see who was in the majority. So the pilgrims probably did what most people would do in that circumstance, which is invite the Indians in for dinner. They stayed for three days. Massasoit sent his hunters out and they brought in five deer. So it was basically a potluck dinner that lasted three days. Think of it as a colonial version of Facebook where everybody hung out, got to know each other, and played Farmville with real farms. When the pilgrims first arrived in 1620, they made expeditions into the countryside. One of their first acts on land was to steal a large cache of Indian corn and a metal kettle with the stated intention to reimburse the Indians later, which they did. They also dug into graves and opened up the burial bundles to examine the skulls. Both were hostile acts that illustrate the European attitude towards the indigenous population. The pilgrims did try to establish peace with the Indians. Of course, they did not have much of a choice. Many Europeans had preceded them to the New World, but the numbers were just not there yet. The pilgrims were outnumbered and easily could have been slaughtered by the Indians, despite the pilgrims' far superior technology and weaponry. Unlike today, the various Indian tribes did not see themselves as one homogenous race. Massasoit's tribe, the Wampanoags, were in a bloody feud with the Narragansett to the north. In fact, the pilgrims came to their aid against the Narragansett. Two years after the big feast, Massasoit got deathly ill, and Edward Winslow traveled the 40 miles to Massasoit's village with medicine to help nurse the great Sachem back to health, for which Massasoit was eternally grateful and pledged his lifelong support to the pilgrims. The British gave the Indians many of the products of their culture, such as cookware, glass beads, fabrics, buckets, foods, tools, weapons, and alcohol. The British were especially happy to get beaver pelts in return, which they shipped back to England as part of their payment to the financiers of the colony. In several places in Mort's relation, the pilgrims expressed their desire to show Christian love and peace to their neighbors. The pilgrims nonetheless considered the Wampanoag people to be inferior savages and used that word repeatedly. At one point, they described a song and dance the Indians performed for them to be antics, like would be done by buffoons. In the year following the feast, Squanto was accused of using his position with the British to spread fear among the Indians, extract payment for his own self-interest, and usurp the authority of Massasoit. Massasoit called for his death. But Squanto died in that year of what the pilgrims called Indian fever but was probably from a European-born disease. Peace was maintained between Plymouth and the Wampanoag for about 40 years, until William Bradford and Massasoit passed away, and the power shifted to the second generation of Edward Winslow's son and Massasoit's oldest son, Wamsuta. In the meantime, many thousands of Europeans had arrived, all looking for land. Wamsuta died under mysterious circumstances after being arrested under Winslow's command. Massasoit's younger son, Metacom, also known as King Philip, became the great Sachem. By 1675, 54 years after the joyous Thanksgiving feast, the number of British colonists had expanded to about 80,000 people, compared to about roughly 10,500 Indians spread across several feuding tribes. 
hostilities and European land grabs had escalated to the point that the Indians had had enough. Metacom led Indian warriors against the colonists in a year-long war known as King Philip's War. Half of the 84 British villages in New England were attacked by war parties. The Indians' goal was to force all the Europeans out. The Europeans' goal was to exterminate all the Indians. The Europeans' advanced technology and weaponry and superior numbers led to a bloody defeat of the Indian forces. Almost a third of the Indians living in the area died, compared to about 800 colonists. The war ended when Metacom was shot dead by another Indian from a tribe that was fighting for the British. The colonists, using the 400-year-old British penalty for high treason against the king, beheaded Metacom, drew his body on a horse-drawn sled, and then cut his body into quarters. His bloody head was impaled on a pole and displayed in the Plymouth Town Square for the next ten years. As a result of the defeat, the Wampanoag, Narragansett, Pequot, and other tribes lost their traditional lands. It should be noted that many other important stories exist about the beginnings of Thanksgiving. Native Americans have thanked their creator and blessed the harvesting of their food for centuries before the Europeans arrived. A settlement in the colony of Virginia celebrated an official day of Thanksgiving dating from 1619, three years before the Pilgrim's Feast. The Spanish in St. Augustine, Florida, are reported to have held a Thanksgiving celebration in 1585, 36 years before the Pilgrim's Feast. Many European countries have held harvest festivals for hundreds of years before the migrations to the New World. And it's been argued that the Pilgrims had observed a Dutch Thanksgiving festival in the city of Leiden where they lived before the Mayflower voyage. AIM, the American Indian Movement, reports the research of William B. Newell, a Penobscot tribal member and former chairman of the University of Connecticut Department of Anthropology. His research concluded that the Thanksgiving holiday resulted from the actions of the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who ordered his militia to attack a gathering in Connecticut of the Pequot tribe for their annual green corn dance, killing 700 people. The next day, the governor ordered a day of thanksgiving, thanking God that they had eliminated over 700 men, women, and children. According to Newell's research, the annual celebrations of Thanksgiving that followed commemorated that slaughter. It also should be noted that Canada celebrates Thanksgiving on the second Monday of October, dating from early harvest festivals in New France, and celebrating the safe return of the explorer Martin Frobisher from a search for the Northwest Passage in 1578. So, what about today? We must remember that the spirit of the pilgrims is still alive and well in America. The Euro-Americans here today are the great-great-great-great-grandchildren of those who invaded and created genocide on the native population. The apple does not fall far from the tree. Remember, it was President George W. Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, who has been accused of grave robbing the bones and skull of Geronimo. No one is more savage than a Euro-American who murders men, women, and children just because they are Indians or just because they are Iraqi. However, since the very earliest European invaders, some have murdered, stolen, and raped, but many Euro-Americans have been understanding, giving, loving, nurturing, and admiring of native peoples, and it is equally important in this modern age to keep a realistic view of the past. Many people paint a picture of pre-Columbian America as a utopian world full of happy native people all living in total harmony with the environment. But one need to go no further than New England to find examples of extremely brutal tortures between warring native tribes such as, for example, the reported practice of binding a captive enemy warrior and then slowly pushing him feet first into the longhouse fire until he was dead. We must remember that savagery is a human characteristic. It is not exclusive to any race, creed, or gender.
So, what is the truth about thanksgiving? The truth is that we should be thankful for the blessings of our harvests. The truth is we should be ever vigilant towards recognizing, understanding, and stopping others who want to exploit us or steal from us. And we should never forget the past. And we should make others aware of the horrors of the past. But in the meantime, why not just sit down, eat some turkey and stuffing, and have some good times with friends and family? Be thankful for the good food and all the blessings we do have in these trying times. Could you please pass the mashed potatoes? Thanks. Save some room for pie. But never forget the truth about Thanksgiving.